Surveyor M9, which uh, now very excited to say is uh, fully integrated with HiPAC. So that's what we're going to go over today. So this, this first uh, screen here shows uh, a reservoir data set that was collected in Hydro Surveyor and then processed in, in HiPAC, which we're going to talk about how that's done a little later in the presentation. So um, I'm joined by Harold Orlinski at, at HiPAC. He's the general manager and has been at HiPAC 10 years. Just going on 11 years now. Yeah, going on 11 years. And um, he has uh, extensive experience in the industry before that and then has been at HiPAC and, and knows HiPAC inside and out. Um, and I'm Isaac Jones. I'm a product manager here at Sontech. I've been at Sontech five years years and uh, was working in school with the USGS uh, doing some hydrographic surveying and surveying before that. So with that, we'll, we'll kick it off and um, give you a little bit of an overview of what we're going to talk about today. So um, we're going to go through, for those of you who don't know, what the Hydro Surveyor M9 is and um, that it's now fully integrated with HiPAC Max and when you you buy a new system or upgrade a system to Hydro Surveyor, you get HiPAC Max software with it now. And then we're going to go through a background of HiPAC Max software, what all is included, what the capabilities are. And then um, we're going to show a case study, which is a, a, a survey done by the USGS in Guam of the Finna Valley Reservoir and step through their process, um, survey the, the final product. Uh, because this, this survey was done in 2014 before the HiPAC integration and so it was collected with the Sontech Hydro Surveyor software. And just a quick point of clarification, we call um, the, the 9-beam ADCP, our M9, is a Hydro Surveyor M9 when it's uh, enabled to do bathymetry surveying. Then we also call the Sontech software that accompanies it Hydro Surveyor. But we're the Hydro Surveyor we're going to be talking about today is mainly going to be the hardware piece that's integrated with HiPAC Max. Um, and then we're going to step into the HiPAC capability to take old Hydro Surveyor software collected data files, the YDFF files, and convert it into a, a format that is usable and you can process in HiPAC. And then we're going to go through HiPAC survey to final product. And then if we have time, we're going to, because this is a single survey, where we don't have two surveys to compare um, a, a volume change or sedimentation, we'll, we'll, if we have time, we'll go into um, a comparison study done with an M9 and, and another uh, survey instrument. Okay, so background on the, the hydro, hydro Surveyor M9, the 9-beam ADCP with three frequencies, so it has two sets of four Janus configuration um, slant beams, so it has uh, three megahertz or 3,000 kilohertz, it has four of those beams, and then it has four 1,000 kilohertz or one, one megahertz beams, and then it has um, a 0.5 megahertz or 500 kilohertz vertical beam, which is aimed directly down. Um, it collects five-beam depth um, with a to a 50 degree swath, so it uses any one of the it uses one of the four beam genus configurations along with the vertical beam at all times, and switches based on depth and water velocity if you're measuring water velocity. And so it, it can survey from 0.2 to 40 meters with all five beams, and then up to 80 meters with the vertical beam, and it simultaneously records depth and measures water velocity, which is is, is unique about the system. The sound speed corrections, um, so we have the, the Sontech Castaway CCD, which we'll briefly talk about, um, and that can, that's fully integrated with HiPAC as well, so that can be used to correct for sound speed in environments where that's important. And um, for those of you who know, if you're, if you're measuring depth with a slanted beam, that becomes important when you're looking at your, your effective depth and not actually just the range of the beam. Now I'll pass it over to, to Harold to talk a little bit about HiPAC Max software. So HiPAC Max, for this project, you know, we're looking at the M9 Hydro Surveyor. 
And in the case where we have on the right hand side, uh, the final products are the M9, you know, survey contours and soundings. But what's unique about the M9 is the bottom screen with a vessel with the five beams trailing behind the boat. So during the survey, we're seeing each individual beam. We're going to color code it by, by depth. Um, and that's the uniqueness of, of the integration between the, the M9 and, and HiPAC. HiPAC itself is a powerful data collection, um, hundreds of different senses, generic, generic senses, individual senses. Um, pretty much any sensor out there will be able to, to, to collect inside HiPAC. We can combine bathymetry, topography, LIDAR, multiple sensors. We can do a single beam side scan simultaneously. Processing the data, we have different mechanisms to process through single beam editor, multi beam editor. And the important thing is to get the data out, get it out to the customer or the client. You know, we can do it BXF, XYZ, KML, KMZ, and some of those are the examples that we're going to show uh, during this, this presentation. Um, I'll, I'll pass it back to Isaac for a few more minutes, and then I'll go into some of the, the data collection and processing for using the Hydra Surveyor. Okay, and I, I mentioned the, uh, thank you, Harold. Um, I mentioned the Castaway CTD, so it's a, that's a Sontex tool for measuring conductivity, temperature, and depth. And then uh, from that, we can calculate sound speed. So the screenshot here shows a survey, and the icons on the screen show that the survey, uh, during the survey, the Castaway was what we call cast. Basically means lower to the bottom and brought back up to measure conductivity, temperature, and depth. And um, one of the big advantages of using HiPAC and the Castaway is that it's fully integrated. So the Castaway has Bluetooth communication, so you can make, make your measurement and then bring it back up. And then Bluetooth, you can bring in the sound speed data and correct for sound speed in the HiPAC software without having to go out to any other software or make any exports or anything like that. Another thing that has been added to HiPAC 2016 is that um, this capability to interpolate sound speed corrections based on space and location, so um, or time and location. So we have casts at different times during the survey, but we also have casts in different locations. And so what HiPAC does is it takes the closest cat, it interpolates between the casts based on time and then and then also location and gets these intermediate uh, sound speed profiles to correct the data in the best best possible way to get the most accurate depth data from your sound. So our, our case study is um, a USGS survey of the Fenner Valley Reservoir in Guam. This uh, work was done by, by Matt Martineau at the USGS and uh, it was uh, this, this is a very important reservoir in Guam because it's the primary source of water for the U.S. Naval Base and then it's also um, a source of, of water for some of the residents of Guam. And they surveyed using two methods. So they used the Hydro Surveyor M9 and Castaway CTD for sound speed correction. Then they also used a multi-frequency single beam sub-bottom profiler that was run on uh, collected using other software because they used our Sontech Hydro Surveyor software because that was the only tool available at the time to collect the bathymetry data with the M9. So their objectives were to determine the, the current storage capacity of the reservoir and then also to kind of try and get a handle on what the loss of storage capacity has been since the construction in 1951. Um, and then from that get a rate of storage capacity loss due to sedimentation. And what I didn't include here is also to try and get a handle on sedimentation rates. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Next slide here. And the, the screenshot on the right is um, is an image from from Matt's report. It, it shows the contours of, of the reservoir overlaid on the on satellite imagery. Okay, so um, here's the the results from the survey. Uh, the, the the current storage capacity of, of 2014 was about six thousand, almost seven thousand acre feet. Uh, survey prior to construction, so before they filled the reservoir, uh, the storage capacity was determined to be right around 8,000 acre feet. So they determined that there's been a decrease in storage capacity of about um, 1, 000, approximately 1,500 acre feet, or 17% um, of a decrease. 
decrease. And of, of the live storage area, they had a decrease of 372 acre feet. So that's 6%. So a live storage area, for those of you who don't know, is, is just the, the, the storage that can be accessed by the, by the outflow. Um, anything below that is, is dead storage area because it can't be readily accessed. So there's been an average store, storage decrease of about 23 acre feet per year since construction. And from the report, uh, they determined that uh, the sedimentation rates can be determined because there's some there's a little bit of inaccuracies or the the datums used in earlier surveys. There's there's, there's some uncertainty there. So another um, modern survey would need to be done to start getting a handle on sedimentation rates. And just some facts about the survey. Um, they ran uh, 48 kilometers of survey lines over, I think, three days. And uh, the reservoir is 2,000 meters long and 500 meters wide at its widest. And um, it's got, uh, the, at its deepest point, it's about 21 meters deep. Okay, so here, um, here I want to show, uh, just, I'm not going to read through this whole slide, but this shows conceptually the steps that Matt and, and his team had to go through to get from uh, collecting data, navigating the survey with Hydro Surveyor software and the M9, all the way to some final products. So the last two boxes show the final products. The different shape boxes indicate different softwares that needed to be used in order to get there. So you can see that they had to use Hydro Surveyor software, um, ArcGIS, Excel and MATLAB, um, and some back and forth between some of those to to get to um, to where they could calculate a surface area, a cumulative storage, and then create these, these contour maps. And this is this is a relatively involved process. It involves some expensive softwares and and takes quite a bit of time. So there's the three days to collect the data, which is relatively quick. It's not a large reservoir, but it's um, relatively quick amount of time to collect the data, but then there's there's quite a bit of time in post processing that was involved um, in 2014. And now to to kind of highlight um, the the added value of the high pack integration, I'm going to hand it back over to Harold, and he's going to go through uh, the data flow collection to final product and how it is now with high pack 2016. Okay, that's my time to talk. Um, so the three days of data collection, and whether it was three or five or a week of, of processing, you know, we're going to look at it in a different way through HiPath, where pretty much we'll be able to come from the data file to come off the boat to final product in, in you know, one-tenth of the time, if I, if I come up with a, you know, a quick number. But we have this data through the Hydra Survey M9 through HiPath Survey which is our REW files, our word data files, or we have these YDFF files, which we'll have to convert to word data files. With an REW file, we can go to the single beam editor, and I'm going to show the single beam editor some of the features and the advantages and, and a, a quick preview of the 2017 update to the 64-bit single beam editor, which really enhances the capabilities of the, the M9 system. The output for the single beam editor, XYZ, or an edited file, will go into TIN model, which does our volumes and contours, and or well, we can plot it out, cross sections and volumes, which is another volume methodology, or well, other ways of outputting data through KMZ or, or DXF or export files. So the idea is that a single program should be able to collect, process, and, and create final products, you know, transparent to jumping between programs and saving different file formats. And I'm just going to jump back in real quick here. Um, Harold said it well, but I just want to reiterate that. So this this means that now with a, a, a Hydro Surveyor M9, you can um, collect a survey, navigate a survey, post process all the way through using HiPack. Or if you have previous data collected, like um, Matt does with this uh, this Guam survey, um, we can take the YDFF file and within HiPack we can convert it to a HiPack format and then do the, the, the post-processing to final product as well. So for data collection, the example I have shown on the screen is, is how we would collect a, a, a Sontech system in, in HiPath. We have a GPS, and on a mobile, we're going to have Sontech. The reason we put it on a mobile is because the M9 is actually another 
positioning system, we can use it for, for bottom tracking. So if we lose GPS, we can use the bottom tracking system from the M9. So the way it works in IPAC is we're going to stick it on a mobile. But the IPAC data collection for, for systems is hundreds and hundreds of different devices we could use. And there's no limit that I can all use two. I can add a magnetometer, a sub-bottom, or any systems concurrently with this M9. Select the device, add the offset, and how we connect it, whether it's serial or, or network. Um, it's a pretty straightforward you know, way of, of collecting data. And, and I just want to quickly say that uh, for, for those of you who don't know, bottom tracking basically means it's uh, positioning based on the acoustics of the, the M9 instrument. So if GPS signal is lost, say under a bridge or under a canopy, habits, it can still continue to collect its relative position until GPS is regained. One other thing I'll jump in on, on, on ISIC is when I mentioned the GPS, we can use the internal external. The, the Sontag has a PCM GPS, but if you wanted to use your own GPS, the setup is exactly the same. It's just how we connect it. So regardless of the, the, the GPS you use, the setup for the M9 HiPAC integration would be what we see on the screen. Another part of HiPAC which is very important and a lot of folks take it for, for granted is the geodesy. Working on a standard UTM in, in meters in northern hemisphere or southern hemisphere is, is pretty straightforward. But you know, the uniqueness of HiPAC is we can go on any grid, any zone, any ellipsoid, do a data transformation as needed. So if you're working on a non-standard format or non-standard you know, units, um, HiPAC can handle the geodesy. It'll take the, the latitude and longitude and convert it to the proper X and Y um, coordinate system. Once we get the, the survey hardware set up and the geodesy set up, we'll go into HiPAC survey. And this is a typical output screen or one of the screen displays that we'll see in HiPAC survey. The left-hand side, we'll see the boat on the screen following a track line. I made up a track line real, real quick to show a left-right indicator. The middle part is the Sontec device driver. In this case, we're showing the bottom depth. I'm showing five depths. And we're going down a slope. So we can see the, the, all the beams tracking with one another. And finally, on the right-hand side is the data display. If you want individual information of, of any ancillary information or individual beam information, you can get that in real time. So in real time, this is your QC window, one of your multiple QC windows that you can show during the data collection. So the Sontex driver, the data display is one I just showed, but we can also show the velocity or the bottom track. It's just being tabbed over. And to save space, we, we decided to have three separate tabs as opposed to one window that would be open three times. But most of the time we're going to show the data display. If you want to switch over to velocity, we can do that. Or if you're doing bottom track, you can see the relative position of the boat versus, versus the system that's being computed by the, the bottom track mechanism. Data collection is only half the job. The other part is, is processing. And there's two workflows that we see. The high-pack collected data files, these were data files. Um, go through a single beam editor, have an edited file, which we call EDT, but it's our edited file. Come up with XYZs to final products. And all that's done in single beam editor. Final products, we can go through a tin model or cloud or, or cross sections and volume. So we consider that final products. The data set from Guam was previously collected in these YDFF files. And the thing is, we have to convert those to high pack file format. We, we like to be high pack specific. So we have a quick converter, YDFF to RAW converter. And once we have these RAW files, we're going to the single beam editor to make our final products. So what we see on the left-hand side is, is the sample of the files. We are going to see both RAW and YDFF. So I took the YDFF files from the Guam data, created these RAW files, and, and we went to the processing route. The YDFF to H, the RAW converter, it was one of those pro programs that I didn't want to just put a standalone program. I had to put it somewhere. So I put it in this program called HSX Converter. It's a converter program that handles single beam, multi-beam, side scan, sub-bottom. The naming is probably not the best naming. I apologize for that. It's, it's called HSX Converter. And to make it even more confusing, I put in the side scan drop-down menu and the side scan data reformat. But it works fine in terms of converting white DFF files to an, H, to an RAW file. If you already have settings set up, we have a special geodesy. We can either use a defined geodesy or just a standard UTM geodesy. 
when we create this RAW file, I just want to give a little bit of a quick background. We run a data file, and it's an ASCII file. You can open it up, and we take it for granted that it goes into single B matter and it does all the processing. But the file itself holds all the all the sensor information. It's time tag with a you know, three character ID at time, and the data information. POS is your position device, and HCP is your heat compensation. There's a, a pitch-rail sensor on the system. Gyro is gyro. But the important one in this case is ECM. It's your echo sound. The echo sound is multiple. It's a multiple transducer, in this case, nine. And if we look at that ECM line, we notice there's nine depths. This is the nine and the fourth character over. Followed by you know, data. And all the data that's coming from the sensor, and the nadir depth is 8.95, and the four other depths that we're collecting will be the ranges that we're going to store in the data file. And when it switches from the high to the low frequency, we're going to populate the other four. Not a whole lot you need to know about the raw data files, but all the information that's being collected will get stored as time tag to the millisecond accuracy. We got through the single beam editor. We had to make an adjustment to single beam editor, and this is why one reason we came up with this new multi beam uh, single beam editor. With single beam editor likes high and low frequency. It likes two. In this case, we have five beams. So we had to come up with some unique solution to come up to process this, this M9 data. We didn't want to do it five different times. We wanted to have one single session. So in this case, when we bring in this M9 dialog box, box pops up, it shows use vertical beam only if you just want to use the native depth. Um, I, I, you can, but the whole idea is that you have five beams. You might as well use all five. So the second option is the one we're going to choose, all beams. I say that we switch zeros and in depth between the high and low frequency, as I just said, based upon depth and velocity measurements. We don't really care about the ones that are giving us zero, so we're going to ignore the lines that have zero depth. We're not going to show all nine. We're only going to show five at a time. We're going to basically show just the ones that have depth with it. You want to just do a select depth, maybe you know, beam number five, beam number seven, or beam number two. You can say not selecting M9, Sontag M9, bad terminology. Basically, it says which transducer number do you want to use. But the one that we're going to look at is this whole beam, ignoring zeros. Typical single beam editor profile allows you to see the single line across. In this case, it's 14 minutes of data shown in a single profile. We have nine beams, five of them being active. This is a one of the not one of the nine beams. So we're going to look at five of them each one at a time. The important thing is we want to try to get rid of some of the flyers. We want to check the ancillary data and check the navigation. So we're looking at you know, this data set as a whole to do some QC, some editing, some, some filtering on the data set. The highlight I have here is that there's a couple of points that don't track in the bottom. And no system is perfect. This one is, is, is relatively clean data. But imagine if you had flyers all over the place. You have to be able to clean out those points. We don't want them to be part of our final data set. So in this case, I have a half dozen points that are off the bottom. I, mean, it's, I don't think they're part of the bottom. I'm going to filter them out or clean them out. There's probably five or six different ways to clear data out of a single beam matter. You can window an area. You can do a line above and line below. You can place filters in, say anything less than a half a meter, anything greater than 22 meters, remove. We know that the survey went to 20 meters, so we're not expecting anything less than that. And we want to get rid of some of the surface returns. So whether you do a manual or automatic routine to, to remove these flies, that's our job in single beam editor. But it goes fairly quick. Like I said, this is a 14-minute profile line. In about 15 seconds, we can get the complete editing done. And, and I'll jump in here again quickly. Uh, this was a, a big request that we had here at Sontech with uh, the previous uh, Sontech HydroSurveyor software which was mainly centered around planning your survey, navigating your survey, and then visualizing your data. But we didn't have a tool for removing bad soundings. And as anybody who's been out there knows, it, it happens. It, it can be as little as like uh, a, a bad return off of a fish or, or some kind of debris in the water. And uh, to be able to remove these, uh, these, these flyers, these outliers, is, is a fantastic tool and the different tools available to you um, at, through the HyPAC software make it very easy to do. The next screen shows a couple more of the QC windows within a single beam editor. The one on the left is the impressive one where I'm showing the track line data, which we might have seen before. But in this case, I'm showing five individual tracks because each beam 
has its own track line data. I'm also just color coding it by depth. So it gives you a general overview of the color depth. Uh, if there's any correcting lines that, that don't follow the trend, there might be a problem with the data. If you have any editing we can do, if you, you want to smooth the data, I generally don't recommend that. But we can smooth the data and clean the data out through the track line editor. We have the ancillary information, the pitch and roll and the heading sensor. We can flag it and, and, and identify areas that are or bad. And the bottom part is this spreadsheet. We can export out not just X, Y, and Z, which is a single button to export X, Y, Z. But if you wanted, for instance, X, Y, latitude, longitude, number of satellites, press track error, any information that was collected during the survey, we can export out. Once we get through this, this, this single beam editing session, we come up with either, like I said, an X, Y, Z is a single button output or an edited file. Either one will work in X. In, in all the programs within IPAC. If you want to hand someone data, you're going to hand them an XYZ. There's no sense handing them an edited file because they won't know what to do with it. it it's open format, but it's, it, it's just not a very user-friendly format. So XYZ, if you want to stop processing and hand someone off and put it in the cloud. But if you want to continue processing, we have these edited files. And we'll go into TIN model. And TIN model can take in a single surface. If we have multiple surveys, we can take in a second surface to do it, a, a tin to tin comparison, a volume to volume comparison. But let's concentrate on the Guam data. We have a single surface from, from the data. And so we'll bring it in as an XYZ data. One of the things we had to do was we had to find the boundary of this data because we didn't want to go across these, these zones or, or this island on the south, south part that, that covered it because tin's going to make a surface. So we had to come up with a border file and clip the tin to a border file. Pretty straightforward to do that. In a 2D display, we can get a general overview of the data. We can do a profile section. Bottom left, I can show a profile section across. And then the profiles can either be color coded by depth or just uh, as a single profile color. Export it out as, as, a, as a TIFF image or, or as a bitmap image. Um, but this gives you a general overview of the, of the data file itself uh, in, a, in uh, beginning to model. You know. and, and just to jump in one more time quickly, uh, Matt, when he was doing his processing, had to export all the data to um, ArcGIS, or actually in ArcGIS, he had to digitize the shoreline uh, of the reservoir based on high-resolution satellite imagery. If you can get high-resolution satellite imagery that's geo-referenced, you can bring it straight into HiPAC and then do that piece of the work where you uh, create a border file and you can set the border file to a, a certain elevation within HiPAC, so it eliminates uh, going out like an export and import and, and extra work on, in that respect. Right. Another view in, in TIN model is our 3D view. So we start modeling the data. We want to see stuff more than just X, Y, Z. So here's our 3D model. Um, with this 3D model, I can export it as a bitmap image. If I rotate it properly, I can make it as a geotiff export, send the eliminated image to be brought into back into HiPAC, into survey, or hand it off to someone else. Again, we're trying to get the data out of HiPAC into you know, someone else's format or common format. So a geo-reference or geo -tip file is, is one of the outputs. So in our 3D model, this is what we're starting to see. Now we're going to start doing contours and volumes within this data set. So the volume in this case, we have a single survey. So we're doing a reservoir volume. And every one meter, in this case, it, it could be used to define, but then I, I decided one meter. Every one meter, I'm going to come up with a volume above and below and surface area above and below. And for instance, I can say at 10 meters, what is the volume above and volume below? How much volume of water is left in this res reservoir? We can get a total volume uh, of the entire reservoir or at a certain level. The other thing we can do is a tin to tin comparison. If I have a survey from 2014, I did a survey next year in 2017, I can see how much material accumulated or, or depreciated from, from this survey. Um, so a tin to tin survey or tin to tin surface or a volume to reservoir uh, value is what we can do for in this case. The other part of tin model is creating these contours. Now remember that the project that we were handed off was all these things were done but not in a single program. This is still high pack and it's just a tin model, but in in TIN model, we're creating these contours. In this case, I'm doing a, a color-filled contour at two meters. Contour level can be user defined. It could be predefined a half meter, one meter, two meters, but filled or not filled, smooth or not smooth. But contouring is, is a very impressive part of the TIN model. If 
HIFAC is the only place in HIFAC we can do this contour. Another output for a TIN model is, is export soundings. If you want soundings from the entire survey, single beam editor does that. It gives you all X, Y, Z. If you want a grid of soundings, if you want to put a couple spot soundings so you can plot out the data, TIN model can put it out spot soundings. Here, in this case, 25 meter soundings. Remember, though, a TIN model is going to create a surface, so there's going to be soundings that there wasn't associated with an actual point. It's a surface sounding. If you wanted all the points uh, without any interpolation, we'll go into uh, map for it as an export as select, select a sounding routine or straight out of um, single beam editor. So we have to put it all together. So we went through our, our, our data collection, whether we collected it or the YDF app, we converted them to an RAW file, went through a single beam editor, went through a single beam editor to, to TIN model. TIN model create, came up and created these contours, these spot soundings, and this, this, this nice color image of the reservoir. And from start to finish, these, these 30 to 48 kilometer lines, three days worth of survey, to get to this image took me about 45 minutes. So compare that to the previous survey where they jumped through different programs and, do, and, and different file formats. This was a single program doing all the work. In 45 minutes, we ended up with a, a survey results with this. HiPack itself can also export data to a KMZ file. So again, handing lots of data to someone else, we can create these, these Google Earth files, create a small little KMZ file, send it off in an email, they plop it into Google Earth, and this is what they're seeing. They can fully rotate it and show the soundings and contours. Anything that we created in HiPack, or pretty much anything we created in HiPack, can be exported out as a, as a KMZ or to a KMZ file. The left image shows the reservoir in its current state. I, I pull that off Google Earth. And then I plop down the survey that we collected. Notice the agreement is perfect. It's only because the geodesy that we created was, was spot on. Um, I wanted to show uh, two slides now of, of coming up. It's a preview of the new single beam editor. This is coming up soon. I have a copy. It's still being tested. We're trying for a beta release October 1st, but certainly it'll be in 2017. And the idea about the single beam editor, we're, we're, again, we're limited to two soundings. We made the adjustment to the M9 to handle five of them, but he, he is still doing one beam at a time. So if you have five beams, you're going to go through that profile five times. It's fairly quick. It's 10 to 15 seconds, but it's still five times. So the new single beam editor now allows us to either see a single line or all five or all nine, It'd be whatever we you put into it. There is no limit. We took off from the multi-beam editor, the same type of shell, it's a 64-bit environment. So the first screen shows, the top part shows all the data, the profile as, as track line, which we've seen before in the 32-bit, but we can color code it a little bit different. The bottom section is a blow-up of the soundings, individual soundings, instead of just a point data, I can show individual soundings. Again, I can still do that in the, in the previous one, but the next slide is a little bit more impressive uh, of showing the profile. The top screen shows all five beams. Remember, again, we're doing five at a time. All five at once. Now, this is a one point out there as a flyer. Well, the bottom one shows I only want to show two beams. I want to show beam number five and beam number nine. I want to see how they compare. So in terms of processing, now we can process all the lines together in a single session, but we still have the ability to look at each individual line. This is coming out. Like I said, in the next three to four months, and it's it's geared for the M9, but it can be used for any single beam system. Okay, so that that wraps up the main portion of our presentation, and uh, I want to say thank you to, to Matt Martineau at the USGS for um, sharing his his survey data with us and and being kind enough to take the time on the phone to kind of explain the process that he went through and 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 um, give us some input on on the M9. Um, but now, so it's, it's only been about 35 minutes, so we have some time to, to step into a comparison with the M9, uh, M9 data collected with HiPAC and then a, another survey device. Uh, but I, I didn't mention this at the beginning, so I want to interject here and say that um, at the end, we'll take questions and, and provide um, the best answers we can. And so if you have questions throughout the the rest of the presentation, go ahead and, and send them in on the, the chat function, and then we'll get to as many as we can in the remaining 10 to 15 minutes. And then if your question, if we don't have time to answer your question, don't worry. 
Um, we'll record them all down and then we'll provide answers and those will go out and then e a follow-up email to, to the webinar. So with that, um, we'll move on to uh, looking at some data where uh, HiPAC ran some tests with the, running the M9 with HiPAC and uh, compared it to a multi-beam sonar. So this is it's just a three or four minute presentation and, and like a lot of presentations, a lot of them are just Redone. This was given at the U.S. Hydro, uh, the Canadian Hydrographic Conference um, earlier this year, and the idea was to you know, see really the, the system capabilities for the M9 independent survey, which we're using a high-end multi-beam system. And at the end of the day, what's the accuracy? What's the difference between the two? And, and is there a, can we use one reliably reliably for the you know for a depth sensor? So. We said this before that the, the, the coverage of the, the M9 is about 50 degrees. It's a 24, 25 degree offset angle. So we're getting about one times water depth SWAT coverage. I'm comparing it to a multi-beam, which is three to five times water depth. So it's not a true comparison, but I'm looking for the depth comparison. I want to see what the depth that, that overlap of, uh, will compare well. So this is our survey area. It's off, off Providence, Rhode Island, um, half dozen lines. A couple of feature sets, it was a dredged area, so I wanted to get a, a little bit more than a flat bottom to give me a challenge to see if the M9 is going to, you know, meet up to its standards of finding the depths or can accurately find the depths as compared to a multi-beam system. Surveys were taken a week apart, so it's relatively close to the same survey boat. The system itself used the same sensors except for the sonar. It would use the beam ultrasonic and use an M9. One would use high pack survey, the other one used high pack survey, high sweep survey. Castaway was brought in. So I tried to keep everything the same except for the individual sonar. Processing, the bottom portion is what we looked at already where we took this raw data file, threw it in a single beam max, came up with these edited files to TIN model. We wanted XYZ, but a TIN model is going to do the, the comparisons. The multi-beam data went through MB Max, the different processing, but we still came up with an XYZ file, which again went into TIN model. So now we have two XYZ files going into TIN model, and now we're going to start doing the comparison. A uh, quick review of the single beam editor. There's a couple of slides, so we had to get rid of those slides. They didn't, we didn't want to skew the data. Um, but again, it's a very clean data set, so there wasn't much in terms of editing that we had to worry about. TIN model was able to do output the contours. In this case, we notice in the center of the screen, the center on the right, I'm showing two contours uh, of, a, of the dredged area. That they line up relatively or almost on top of each other. The blue data is the multi-beam data. The black data is the contours created from the M9 XYZ data that the uh, TIN model did. There's a little bit of noise, and that's expected only because I am doing some interpolation across where I don't have 100% complete coverage. We look at, it at just a profile and cross sections and volume. There's the red is a multi-beam, the green is the M9 data and single beam mass. I also did processing of the M9 and the multi-beam data, um, but those, those differences are the same as the M9 and single beam. But on a flat area, relatively flat, where there, there's nothing in between, it, it, it does a really good job in terms of agreement. The problem is what happens when there's a bump between the two single beam lines, or two M9 lines. You'll have, it's going to have the same problem with a, a traditional single beam system. You're not going to get 100% coverage. But the areas that do agree or, or do overlap, we have a really good agreement. And then going through the statistics, we can see how well this system is. And if we look at the difference, we see a mean difference of about 11 centimeters between the two surveys and a standard deviation of under 30 centimeters, 26 centimeters, which still, which is under the IHO order survey standards, survey one. So with it, you know, with the proper equipment, the proper survey, this system does a really good job in terms of the accuracy of the system. I am going to say as a conclusion on that, it's not going to replace your multi-beam system because it doesn't have the coverage at 50 degrees is the maximum. But for hydrographers interested in obtaining the simultaneously current and depth measurements and using a DVL, you can certainly add to your future set. So uh, thank you all uh, for joining. And with that, uh, thank you, Harold, for joining me. And we'll take any questions. So we've been having quite a few questions come in via the chat. And uh, I just want to reiterate that 
it will answer what questions we have in the time that we have, and then and if we don't get to all the questions, we'll send a follow-up email that has all the questions and answers um, uh, shortly, probably by the end of the week, early next week. So um, we'll, we'll try and alternate back and forth uh, between Sontech specific and HIPAC and then competition questions. Um, so I'll start with, uh, we have a question, does HIPAC use the M9 compass for direction to orient the non-nadir beams? Any special setup? So uh, it, yes, it can. Um, so as the M9 users out there know, the M9 has a magnetic compass internally and that can be used to orient the system based on, and orient the beams in, in space. Uh, and uh, so, but in order to do that, the compass, a magnetic compass, it needs to be calibrated and it needs to operate in a relatively clean environment. Um, when I say clean, I mean not much different from where it was, was calibrated and you can't have large metal objects, ferrous objects or magnets or engines close by the M9. That said, if you do have a survey vessel that it's, that it, it's not possible to get away from magnetic interference, um, HIPAC can bring in pretty much any GPS and there's lots of different um, GPS heading sensors out there. So you can use a GPS heading sensor along with the M9 to get um, get around this. And the, to, to follow up on the, is there any special setup needed? Um, yes, if, if you are using a GPS heading sensor and the M9, you'll need to uh, line up the orientations or put in the offset. Um, between the north or positive axis on the uh, on the GPS heading sensor and the M9. Yeah, my turn. I'll, I'll take the first one. If the question is, what's the need for the for the border to create a zero level? Um, it depends on, on the survey area. In the case of the Guam data, when I start pinning the data, and I got to stretch the data, I use it at pin leg size of 70 or 65, and I was stretching across areas that were, were from land to land. I didn't want to include that. So by creating a border file, I'm, I'm able to clip the data to the exact shoreline. If I have a zero level, then that gives me my shoreline data. So it's just a way of clipping the data. If you're in a, in a square area where there's, there's no, no areas of, of crossing of boundaries, then no, you don't need it. But in the case of the Guam data, it was definitely needed because there's actually one little section I, I left in by accident of an area that stretched across the land. And it's because the, the border has to be able to be clip the data. Okay, uh, next question. We have uh, HydroSevere without the upgrade. Can we use RM9 with HIPAC? So um, I hope I'm interpreting this right, but I think what they mean is we have a river surveyor M9. So um, there's uh, the, it's, the hardware is the same. The M9 ADCP, the hardware is the same between river surveyor and HydroSevere, which is the piece that works with HIPAC. Um, you do have to have the system enabled for Hydro Surveyor to work with HIPAC. If you have a system that's just enabled for River Surveyor, um, it does not work with HIPAC, and you'd need to get the, the Hydro Surveyor upgrade. Um, the good news now is that if you get the Hydro Surveyor upgrade, it includes HIPAC Max software, which is $8,000 value um, for much, much less. I think that. Um, uh, compared to the, the old firmware upgrade, it's only $1,600 more for the Hydro Surveyor upgrade um, to get HIPAC Max. So it's, it's significant value and at, added with, with HIPAC on that upgrade. Okay, the question is, um, and I didn't touch up on a lot of it, but it is part of HIPAC. The question is, is there a way to plot 2D depth averaging vectors, velocity vectors in HIPAC? And the answer is yes. The YDFF file that we collect whether it's from a previous survey or during a HIPAC survey, we're going to have YDFF files. Um, we have the RAW files, which have the soundings. But the YDFF files can go into a program called ADCP Profile. It's within HIPAC. And you can show the velocity profile. You can export out 2D and even 3D vectors um, from that program. So it is part of HIPAC. Um, I, I guess I apologize for not mentioning it or, or talking about it. But through the YDFF files and through this ADCP Profile program, the vectors can be exported out. Yeah, that's sort of sort of the nature of this um, case study is that it's a reservoir, so we don't have real velocities that would register, or, or it'd be very small velocities to register. 
to show with this this data set. So maybe that's a, a good topic. It's a good question and a good topic for uh, a future webinar, perhaps. I was um, practicing while well, Isaac was speaking of, of the velocity vectors, and in the reservoir there was no velocity. I mean, it changed so little. So, and that's the problem. If, in the reservoir, you're not going to get much, but we have other examples. If anyone wants, I can show you with the, the vectors output. Yeah, and just to, just to reiterate, because there's another question here, so it's obviously a hot topic. The question is, what about current meter measurement? So the, one of the real advantages of using the M9 with HiPAC is that um, every, every um, sample includes five beam depth data and velocity profile data from near the sensor to near the bottom. So if you're in a river channel or you're in, in a bay or estuary where you actually are going to have um, significant velocities, you will be measuring both at the same time and it's all captured um, with, with, with your survey. It just depends on what your, your interest is, what, what you actually want to look at. Question about AutoCAD and CAD. Um, can you export these formats? We can export DXF and DWG and DGN in a program called Export and it works with edited files. Again, everything has to get into this edited file format. And if you're staying within HiPAC, it doesn't matter, you know, you're not going to be able to read an edited file format. But this program called Export will handle these input files from the EDT files and be able to export out the DXF and DGN and DWG files. Okay, so uh, here's another really good one. Um, if I have a Hydra Surveyor, how much for HiPAC? So, uh, this question alludes to there was there was the, the Hydra Surveyor M9 system that was run by the the, the Sontec software prior to the the HiPAC integration, and some so some users just have the Hydra Surveyor firmware, but they didn't get HiPAC with with the package. Um, and typically, the answer would be you have to buy HiPAC Max, which is an eight thousand dollar package, but. Uh, because this integration is brand new and, and we want it to be available to all Hydra Surveyor users out there that, that adopted the technology before the integration, um, we have a promotional deal going through um, July of next year where if you send us your, your serial number on your M9 and we can verify that it, it is enabled for Hydra Surveyor, you can buy um, HiPAC Max $8,000 value for $2,400. So get get in touch with uh, you can go on our website and uh, put uh, go to the contact us section and you can ask for a, a quote for for high pack. And my turn. Um, we actually had two questions on this topic and, it, and they're actually good questions. If you think about a multi beam survey, one of the parts about a multi beam is the whole initialization of the setup and you have a motion sensor and a multi beam and and there's always this calibration patch test and setting up the system. So is there a need to do a patch test or how do you do a patch test with the system? And, and the thing is, you, because it has the internal compass, the uh, internal motion sensor, the pitch and roll, um, you don't need to do it. Um, if you have an external one, um, we're going to run the external sensor. We'll run it as similar as we do in, well, in this case, we're going to have to run the data through MBMAX. Um, the data itself can go through MBMAX. Um, but we're not going to, you know, uh, you know, require folks to do it that way. So the idea is that the internal pitch and roll sensor is, is built in that we don't have to worry about an external patch test calibration. Excellent. Thank you, Aaron. So uh, we have a last few questions, and then we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. We still have uh, quite a few questions that we're not going to be able to get to. But uh, like I said earlier, we'll, we'll send out, out a follow-up email that um, includes all the questions asked during the webinar and with our answers. So next question that I got is, um, can you use RTK? That's an excellent question. And the answer is absolutely. And um, with HiPAC, uh, it's, it's now, uh, the answer is pretty much almost any RTK system. Um, pre previously, with, with Sontech, um, the Sontech Hydra Surveyor software, you could use quite a few different um, RTK manufacturers, brands. We, we provide um, an integrated system with our power and communication modules, which is a hemisphere system. But <coughs> now with uh, HiPAC, you can set up to bring in, in any, almost any um, brand's uh, RTK. Um, 
anything? I, I have one more. Okay, I can. Or no, I think, okay, so with that, I think we, we're um, at time, and uh, thank you all for joining, um, and uh, look out in your email for a follow-up, and for coworkers or other people in your office um, that you know wanted to attend that couldn't attend, um, if they signed up, they'll be getting a link to the recorded um, webinar, and uh, you can forward that on to them if they didn't sign up, um, so they can view the webinar on their own time. So with that, thank you all very much. Thank you, Harold, for uh, joining joining me here at Sontech. And it's always good to be here. If there's any questions on the Sontech, feel free to talk to Isaac. Any questions on IPAC, feel free to give me a call. Or any one of our support groups, they, they can answer your IPAC questions.